All right. I'm so excited to be joined here today by uh, Clark Quinn and get his perspective on a number of things that are in front of us uh, today as L&D professionals. Um, his wisdom is really appreciated on a lot of fronts, and we're going to talk a little bit about strategy today. Uh, Clark, can you give a, just kind of a quick introduction of what, who you are and what you're thinking about? Thanks, Christopher. Yeah, this is uh, interesting times. Uh, and in some way, I feel like I've been preparing for it. Uh, I, you know, to make a long story short, I saw the intersection of computers and learning as an undergraduate design my own major. It's been my career ever since. Realized we didn't know enough, went back and got a PhD in really what was applied cognitive science. And that continued interest in how do we perform and learn? How do we use technology to, to support us in that? And how do we do design processes to make that manifest has remained a consistent across a lot of strange things, being an academic, being a cons uh, working in organizations uh, and now being a consultant. Terrific. Thanks for that. So I thought we would, um, I'm going to put a, a comment here uh, below for people to access. And this is a link to um, one of your, more recent blog posts uh, on thinking about transformation. Uh, and I thought that would be kind of a good topic for us to, to cover here today. There's some really great points in there. Uh, up front, I think one of the ways that you framed that, that post was around us being mindful that, you know, there is this current need to deliver new material in a, or current material in a new way. Uh, but you're recognizing that there are some some opportunities that we should key into other than just this need to digitize experiences because we, we can't get together. Can you describe a little bit more about what you're thinking? Well, and yes, and so um, we definitely need to, you know, too many people are just, you know, I literally have somebody say, could you help me put you know, our training course up online? No, <laughs> because the, you can't do that. It doesn't transfer without some modifications. But the broader perspective is going just beyond the course and just doing formal learning and saying, how are we supporting people overall? The, the fact of the matter is we've got a lot more people working from home. We have them working in strange and new situations. And the easy response that we've seen is people just taking everything they've done and doing it digitally. And I get that, right? But is you know, it, once you've done that, and by now, <laughs> I think you've had some time to get it done, that, that it's time to start thinking about, well, really, if we have this new digital life and work has changed, you know, we are now finding that remote work isn't the disaster or trust sink that we thought it would be. So how do we cope with that? How do we start finding ways to make that as effective and efficient as possible. But so then one of the things that you kind of jumped into, which is uh, I think a really valuable framework is the notion of the four C's framework. Can you describe and give a little brief overview of, of what that is and, and where one might use it? Sure. That came about, it started by looking at how these devices are little mobile phones and things. And, uh, thinking about what are they offering? And as part of my grad school experience, one of my fellow grad students was a guy named Bill Gaver who got into deeply into affordances. He was looking at auditory affordances. How can interfaces use sound to cue us in better? He created the sonic finder for the Macintosh. But that notion of affordances, what capabilities technology offers is something that my uh, PhD advisor took more broadly. And what it says is, what do these things offer as their unique capabilities? And so the four C's framework was a way to try and capture that for mobile devices. And the four C's are content. So you can de deliver content on the device. You can watch a video, you can read documents. The second thing is uh, compute. So they can do things in a mixed initiative dialogue. A game is that some app that use a calculator or something are is a compute capability. So it's a mixed initiative dialogue with you in the system. The third one is communicate, reach out and touch someone. Um, the important thing to recognize is none of those are unique to mobile, by the way. Those mm -hmm. are all available at your desktop. What's important is that now they can be 
accessed anywhere and anyone, wherever you are, you have this. And that's one of the reasons we have these devices are so popular. They, they um, bring us that capability. But there is, the 4C is capture. They can capture their current context. They have cameras and microphones and sensors. And a fifth emergency out of emergent C, <laughs> emergent. <laughs> um, a fifth emergent C is context. Because of you're capturing the context and having the compute capabilities, you can start doing things because of when and where you are. Mm -hmm. So those are the, the capabilities of mobile. But what we want to do is figure out how do we help them help us. Right. All right. I, do you think they're really then directly aligned the the four C's plus the fifth one that is emergent? Are they, are they really aligned kind of directly to how we work? Um, not really. No, they need to be remapped. So when you think about the types of categories of work, sort of a performance ecosystem framework, you think about what well, we do learning, you know, away from work. We do training, we do stuff, we simulate the work experience and give you practice at it if we're doing it right to get it right before you go back to work where it matters, right? You want to practice it and get it safe before you're doing it live with people, particularly if live is on the line or something, right? So formal learning is, is one of the things we do and now it's sort of core to L&D. But as we take a broader performance ecosystem perspective, we start looking at um, how do we support people in the moment? Sometimes we don't need to put it in the head. It can be in the world, and we don't take enough advantage of that. Job edge, checklists, lots of ways of supporting our performance that we're not doing. So, mm -hmm. And those are both for the things we know we need to do. But increasingly, as things are getting more frantic, because we're facing you know, pandemics in this life, we have to start being innovative. And that tends to come from social and informal learning. Social can augment formal. Social can be a part of performance support. But really, it's about more informal learning, more informal support in the moment. So those three together, um, plus uh, you know, doing that wherever and whenever. So those are sort of the performance ecosystem. And that, to me, is what is a mobile mindset because mobile is not just, you know, M learning used to mean just courses on a phone and that's almost the worst thing you can do to support people in the world. There are times, you know, on a tablet maybe, but on a phone, no. So what we wanna do is think differently. How do we use these devices, the mobile device, as a way to start meeting broader needs, not just you know extending courses, augmenting formal, performance support, social informal, and then that fifth C becomes the fourth part of the mobile mindset, contextual. What can we do because of when and where you are? So those are, and it turns out that holds true increasingly at the desktop. Contextual didn't used to make as much sense when we were, you know, knew the context, you were in an office. We're beginning to find out as people are dealing with complex systems. We don't. We can start knowing what they're trying to do, who they are, what they know, and start giving them uniquely targeted advice, whether it's you know adaptive learning or adaptive performance support. So it turns out that thinking about it, supporting people with this mobile digital platform, the mobile device, turns out to be a useful way to think about augmenting performance for people who are working remotely. Mm -hmm. They're the same thing. One of the one of the other things that I really liked about your post was this theme uh, that I, I found it recurring. Maybe you didn't talk about it um, directly. Is that uh, your strategy really needs to be people first focused? And I think um, probably guilty of this myself, <laughs> having some experience, you know, building authoring systems. In that uh, there's there's a tender a rush to think of technology as potentially a magic pill to to solve some of the problems that are in front of us. And some, a lot of that I think has to do with the constraints, the budgets, the timeframes, and all those sorts of things that, that are on us as L&D professionals to push our material as quickly as possible. You know, but what, what do you think really are the, the constraints that we should be mindful of in general when, when we're thinking about employing a new strategy? Well, I'm kind of, you know, maybe I'm a radical or it's because I'm a California or something, but I'm interested in using technology in humane ways. Just using it to shove people out of a job doesn't make sense. Now, automating stuff that can be automated probably should. 
technology is good at certain things, and this is one of the fundamental realizations I'd like people to have. Technology is good at doing rote and arbitrary processes repeatedly. Our human brains aren't. But the flip side is we're really good at pattern matching and meaning making, and it's really hard to get technology to do that. They're doing it with AI. But those are complementary skills. And so one of the things you should be thinking about is how do we combine them? How do we use technology as intelligence augmentation, IA, instead of artificial intelligence, AI? So we need to, um, and to be frank, our previous use of technology wasn't necessarily well done either. And our policies and practices weren't. Um, align for, for getting the best out of people. You look at a lot of organizational practice. So it, this is the opportunity to not only think about, um, you know, how do I digitize everything I'm doing, but is am I what I doing? Am what I doing? Yeah. <laughs> is what I'm doing really the optimal way to be doing it? Can we find a better way to support people? Can we find um, look at their workflow? So back to your question, what are the things to do? I think it's to stop and take a step back and say, what would be good ways to work and how do we support that? Instead of how do we take the way we've been working and just crank it in? Because it may not be the most efficient, the most effective. And you know, the digital transformation was has been touted a lot, uh, but that's about using technology to do more and faster and better. But the better part isn't as considered as well. And the question is, what is better? Is that just cheaper or is it smarter? And I want to suggest working smarter uh, is is the opportunity we have. Yes, I, I agree. And you know, I think when we just think about the word transformation, you can tr transform it to something worse, right? So it's more about making that that shift to something that's comfortable and more performant for for everyone involved. Right. Um, and I want to just elaborate on that just briefly, Christopher, because your point, you know, about taking courses and putting them on, if you just transform online, they're not making it better or even as good. They're making it worse. If you just transform your digitize your processes, given the new context of work, it may actually hinder what you're trying to accomplish. So thank you for that. Yeah. Clear. Uh, on context. So one of the one of the things uh, you have elaborated this up front in our discussion about you know, the mobile phone um, being able to do a lot for us because it comes with us everywhere. It come, you know, in, in the current state, it comes with me to the couch. It comes with me to the kitchen, <laughs> me in the car, uh, you know, but in, in the broader world, I think there's a lot of promise about it knowing where I am and potentially what it is that I'm doing and, and supporting me in a way that's, that's valuable. Uh, can you maybe give a few examples of how someone in L and D could get, started you know affordably and practically to use some of those inputs about our context to deliver something valuable to the student i'm sure uh as you're out and about now that isn't happening as much but when you do have to go out and about just a simple thing built in geofencing is a thing that says when you get to within a range of something trigger a reminder by the way you wanted to pick up some milk you happen to be near the store um, you know, for L and D, it would be more like, by the way, drop in on this customer, or by the way, go check the calibration of this instrument. Mm. Um, that type of uh, opportunistic situation. Um, similarly, one of the things you can do is if you've got two different people visiting a site, a salesperson is going to have very different goals than a service technician. When you're going to visit this customer, salesperson, you should know that they have recently invested in this and our product augments that really nicely. You know, they mm -hmm. recently invested in a, a, in a new content management system and that extends to learning because you can use that to connect to your our LMS and make a portal solution. I'm making this up, obviously. Right. So, when you go to the service person, you say, by the way, they've been having a reliable, a repeated problem with uh, this, would you go in and, and you know, buy, and that happens to be located in this part of the building. So remember to go to building three, not building one when you start. There's various specific type of things that are relevant to your role and your goals, as well as, and what you know. For somebody new, you'd say, by the way, 
Um, I know you haven't done the, been certified in this process yet, but you happen to be here and we're going to ask you to do it as well. But here's a little checklist guide, a step through. Let's give you a conceptual treatment while you're sitting in your car before you go in. Let's go in. Let's, and these can be just created as simple videos and delivered um, contextually. I, as yet, I'm not really uh, sure that there are off the shelf products that do this sort of location based delivery yet. Mm. But it's, these are things that you can potentially link together, work with your IT department. I know everybody knows that the IT is the enemy. <laughs> I always bring this up. I say, well, you get upset when the network goes down? Yeah, that's their job now. And you want to do what? So how do you work with them to keep their network up so you're, everybody's happy, but you also, a good IT department knows they have to continue to expand. So find ways to work with them. Following on then a, a little bit on context, uh, we're, <laughs> We're not, we aren't moving as much. And how, how might we think about some of the contextual things that we have now in this current environment, of maybe being at home or a different environment, uh, and look at our current contextual inputs that might be available to, to help the student? And some of that might be uh, more practices than technology. But recognize there's more distractions. How do you help people simplify and get access to stuff? We haven't necessarily been good enough about providing controls on any media delivery. Um, mm. For goodness sakes, allow them to stop it and deal with that crisis and come back. And you know, somebody's just knocked over the you know all the water in the house or whatever. You know, the the, the, the dog the dog's barking and go. I got to go check the package delivery from Amazon. So. Provide, recognize that there's more distractions. How can you really focus and keep the cognitive load low, keep their attention, help them maintain their attention? How do we break it up more so they can deal with it in more flexible chunks? Do they really have to sit through an entire hour long course or can you give them, you know, six, 10 minute chunks without violating the learning? You know, just breaking it up isn't necessarily the right thing. You know, for compliance right now, we still don't care much, but for anything important, um, <laughs> Can, how do we break it up? And you know, this, again, is the opportunity to do things better. Breaking it up both is, you know, makes it more flexible, but also gives us the chance to do the space learning that's been hard to do when we're tied into uh, training rooms that have to be booked and scheduled in multiple use. Now we can we're gonna do it at home. How can we break it up and take advantage of the fact that people are located here? So. Um, Time and, and distraction, there's a couple of ways in which we might be sensitive to the different ways people are having to work in this area. Awesome. Uh, so the last point I wanted to, to follow up on today is we're, we're so excited to have you as part of the Allen Academy uh, and delivering what, what I know is a really fantastic uh, elective course for us on mobile learning strategy and design. Can you talk a little bit about what a potential student might expect uh, taking this course in September? Right. Um, so it's six weeks. The first week sort of goes back over some of the breaking up some of the ways people tend to think about mobile off the hand. You know, you hear mobile learning and you immediately think courses on a phone. How do we break that? How do we really get down to a definition of mobile that's useful and accurate? How do we deal with tablets and wearables and things? So we sort of get our terminology down and, and get straight. The sec then for each of the weeks, we're going to go through each of those four elements of the uh, performance ecosystem. That's also the, the mobile mindset. That's, you know, we're going to talk about augmenting formal learning. How do you take, what does, how do you augment a course? So it's not delivering learning, it's augmenting. It's, it's you know, helping make it more effective and take advantage of mobile to support learning. Uh, and we'll use go through some frameworks and exercises to, to practice the, the principles. Then we go to performance support, which I think is mobile's natural niche. If you look at mobile, one of the things we'll cover in the first week is the pattern of use of a mobile device is not like the pattern of use with a desktop. It's much more aligned with quick access. That's much more like performance support. So we'll look at that and what does that mean and how do you do it? And again, have some activities to, to put those in practice and, and think about it. 
Then I go into social and informal because, and you know, that's not necessarily unique to mobile in any way, but it's really important to think about um, when you're, how can we make people accessible in ways that are useful for our types of needs when we're uh, working in organizations instead of just reaching our friends? How do we find the right person at the right time? How do we um, go beyond social for formal courses and how do we think about social for informal learning, collaboration and communication? We can then go on to the unique situation of contextual and talk about some of the underlying necessities, which includes, you know, rethinking our content development and rethinking our architectures to, to make this possible, um, some of what we were just talking about. And finally, the, the final week is, is not just a wrap up, but that's where we talk about strategy. It turns out one of the most interesting things when you think about mobile, it's too easy to think about it, it's a tactic. Oh, well, we're gonna put this on a phone and deliver it. Mobile is a platform and what people find out is they put something on a phone and they go out and the people go, oh, what else are you going to do? What else can we do? I'm like, oh, oh, it's not just a solution. It's a platform for solutions and then we're going to want other solutions. And how do you think about that? Plus some of the design and development things that are specific and unique to mobile that, again, play a role. So that's the type of thing. It's really about not how do you develop mobile apps it's not the technology spinning because that changes all the time instead right. what it really is thinking differently to be able to take advantage of mobile that's mm -hmm. the most important thing is developing a mobile mindset and we'll do a lot of continual work to try and uh, get you thinking that way which like us which we've talked about today just happens to be useful mm -hmm. when you need to deal with people in remote and digital environments Fantastic. Well, a, a great opportunity. I'm going to put up um, Quinnovation.com again. Uh, worth checking out Clark's work. And um, you've got great blog posts on there and other materials, um, some new exciting work uh, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's worth checking out. We were having a conversation just the other day about uh, tools that we use for prototyping and OmniGraffle and, and a few others. And I'm, I'm excited to see some of the work that, that you've been using on and in including different dimensions that um, s designers should be thinking about when they're when they're creating their their next their next set of material um, right so and at quinnovation.com there's a link to the blog which is learnlets.com i noticed there's one comment in the um yeah in the, in the chat that came from linkedin i think the issue in lnd is that many decision makers believe that learning doesn't need to be designed it just happens <laughs> Uh, that's sort of a naive psychology. Yes, learning happens, but is it efficient and is it effective? Uh, there are a lot of beliefs about learning that aren't true. You know, learning styles, uh, digital natives, a bunch of stuff. That, and so their naive intuitions about learning is your responsibility to help them develop more useful <laughs> and, and effective frameworks. But, you know, get all the help you can. Yeah, for sure. Thank Fantastic. you. Yeah, good question, for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, th thanks, Clark, for, for joining me today. I'll post a few more things out on these platforms uh, so people can connect with you uh, and look forward to talking again soon. All right. Thanks, Christopher. Much appreciate yeah. it. Thank you, you all. Have a good day. <laughs> Bye.